uh, as Subu said, um, I'm going to be talking about social democracy, um, its accomplishments, its limitations, and ultimately why we need to fight for democratic socialism. Um, so first off, uh, just as way of introduction, I think in these kind of historical discussions, it's always important to place ourselves in context. And um, I think it's important to uh, recognize that, um, you know, kind of the resurgence of um, democratic socialism since 2016, when the first Bernie campaign happened. Um, that's, I mean, that's kind of why we're having these discussions. And um, at the same time, um, there's still a lot of, uh, it's still very muddled and um, there's still like a lot of uh, theoretical things that we need to work out. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is that um, DSA as it exists today basically exists because Bernie Sanders talked about democratic socialism and a lot of people looked up democratic socialism and DSA was what came up. And so all these people came to this organization, um, you know, not, not necessarily having a very coherent vision of what democratic socialism is. So for the past few years, we've been kind of working that out in, um, you know, both in political discussion and in practice through our um, political work. And, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, um, took away from the Bernie campaign this idea of the Nordic model or social democracy. And um, a lot of people um, see that as analogous with democratic socialism. Um, in order to really understand the nuances of this issue, uh, we have to talk a little bit about the history of these two terms and um, and yeah, place ourselves in historic context and kind of take conclusions away from um, from the history and, uh, and, um, guide our political work based on those conclusions. So, um, I think, first of all, the question we need to ask and then answer is, is what is social democracy? There's not really a simple answer to that because it means a lot of different things at different times. And so, first of all, there's pre-World War II social democracy. And then there's post-war social democracy, very different things. Um, so pre-war social democracy is basically uh, in one formulation, uh, the formulation of Karl Kautsky, who was um, one of the major ideological uh, successors of, of Karl Marx and uh, Friedrich Engels. Um, social democracy is the merger of the socialist movement with the worker movement. Um, so up until that point, socialists had been very disconnected from the organic workers movement that had risen up from the misery of, uh, the industrial revolution. And, um, so these two things had been disconnected and for them to be able to act with any efficacy, they have to be, um, merged together so they can act as a coherent force and actually bring to bear the, um, what is in the class interest of the working class, which is uh, namely the abolition of the system, which, uh, you know, uh, oppresses them and exploits them for their labor. Um, so the result of this, uh, the result of this ideological formulation is the creation of mass political parties across Europe, uh, it really starts in Europe in the 1880s. And um, this is really coming out of the thought of Marx and Engels and uh, Engels himself is very intimately involved with uh, the, the creation and early growth of the social democratic party of Germany, um, the SPD. And um, very quickly, uh, parties like the SPD and uh, their equivalents in other countries in Europe really do become mass political parties. Um, they have trade unions affiliated with them. Trade union members uh, are also active social democrats. And these parties have socialist politics too. Um, there are, you know, reformist strains in them, but they're founded on the idea of that we need to um, 
that we need to bring about socialism. And um, and this leads to uh, this leads them to pursue a reform agenda in the short term, seeking to um, alleviate suffering and improve the system somewhat. But also the goal, at least for the left wings of these parties, is ultimately uh, the revolutionary overthrow of um, the capitalist system. And so class struggle is central in this. Um, and it's it's really uh, about um, a democratic uh, party um, with mass membership um, engaging in class struggle in the workplace and in the political arena. And um, the accomplishments of this are very uh, impressive. And um, the SPD especially, which really becomes the first mass political party, the mass, uh, first labor party, uh, is especially impressive. It ends up um, attracting millions of votes. And, uh, and uh, at, at their height in 1914, they had 4,000 paid functionaries, 11,000 salaried employees, um, and 4,000 different newspapers and magazines, and as well as a large uh, delegation in the parliament and um, a presence in all of the state and local governments. And um, so it's very impressive. And uh, so that's pre-war social democracy. It's very important to distinguish that from post-war social democracy. Um, Essentially, what happens in between in that interwar period and um, po in post World War II is uh, a rightward shift in the political parties. Uh, in really 1914 onwards, in Germany, the uh, the right wing of the party wins out, and um, basically, with this right, the right wing of social democracy says is that. We need to give up trying to overthrow capitalism. We just need to settle for improving capitalism as it exists, um, expanding the welfare state, and improving the standard of living of workers, and basically giving them a middle class life. And this is kind of the compromise that all these parties settle on post World War II. Um, and uh, so this is basically a, an abandonment of socialist politics. And um, because of this, um, and it's kind of a two-way street, but these parties begin to lose their mass character. They become increasingly insulated and, um, and uh, driven more by party elites and not by the rank and file of the party. And so basically this model, um, which played out um, especially Sweden is a very good example, um, a party that got its start uh, very, uh, the, the Swedish social Democrats were originally very, very socialist, um, but went to uh, seek this policy of uh, industrial peace, um, basically ca class compromise, making a deal between the labor unions and the bosses um, to ensure uh, an end to um, labor struggles and basically to um, to get some concessions out of the capitalists, but not to um, fundamentally change the social structure um, toward the eventual overthrow. And um, so, I mean, really, in the short term, I mean, this this you know, it it didn't look so bad. Uh, I mean, Sweden and countries like it established the highest standard of living. Um, they had vast welfare states and uh, really a lot going for them. Um, but because they were un because these parties were unwilling to engage in class struggle, um, the gains that they made were very short lived and were easily rolled back when um, capital struck back basically and got organized and uh, and started to roll back these reforms. And this is really the world that we're living in now, the post, uh, you know, the, the post social democracy world where so social democracy as it existed has been rolled back and um, 
And I mean, there are still remnants of it in Europe, especially in Scandinavia, but it's just, uh, it pales in comparison to what it was uh, um, in the seventies, for example. And um, so, yeah, it's just this long uh, process of chipping away at um, the gains that they made. And essentially um, because the parties were unwilling to be hostile and um, confrontational with capital, um, capital was able to um, organize against them. Because if you're pursuing reforms that are weakening capital rather than, um, if, you're, if you're pursuing reforms and um, pushing an agenda that weakens capital, then they won't be able to organize against you as effectively. And, um, and there are attempts from the left wings of these parties to, uh, to redirect the energy of the parties um, towards socialism again. And um, one of the famous examples of this is the Meidner plan. Um, Meidner was a socialist in the Swedish Social Democratic Party who put forward this program that would, over a period of time, um, bring uh, companies into uh, worker ownership with wage earner funds. It's not super important to go into the details of that, but essentially what it would mean, um, and you can look up more about it if you want, there are plenty of Jackman articles about it, uh, but what it would mean was that uh, a huge chunk of the economy over a period of 20 years or something would uh, become owned by workers. And eventually that means that, uh, I mean, um, eventually if you keep on that path, you end up with uh, full worker ownership of the economy, which um, is socialism. Uh, and um, so the defeat of the right wing, uh, of the left wing proposals basically um, destroys these parties, their membership declines massively and um, really since the, the 80s, especially, I mean, the capitalist parties in Europe have been ascendant and um, the social democratic parties that still do exist um, have been thoroughly neoliberalized and are um, pursuing a, uh, pursuing um, austerity agendas um, when they are in power. Um, so they've really fully abandoned socialist politics. There are still strains in, um, in the social democratic parties of uh, socialists, um, but they're definitely not ascendant. Um, so that's kind of, that's where we are. And so what do we take away from this, uh, from the, these historical lessons? I think it has to be that we have to go beyond social democracy. Um, and I think uh, that um, I think that democratic socialism puts forward a positive um, a positive vision of the future and has a strategy for getting there, um, which recognizes the successes of social democracy, um, especially the fact that. It you know establishes really high standard of living and improves the improve the lives of workers, um, gave you know gave them strong labor unions to to fight in, and uh, and you know uh, it improved the welfare state to such such a degree that pe everyone was able to live a dignified life. But we also need to recognize that it's not enough ultimately because all of these things can and will be rolled back. If we leave it at that, if uh, if we just pursue reforms in the short term and don't have any positive uh, overarching um, vision for how we're going to overcome rather than just improve capitalism. And so what this looks like um, dem is democratic socialism. And I think an important point is that the reforms that we pursue need to be uh, what some have termed non-reformist reforms. So the idea basically is that, you know, there are a lot of reforms that are good in and of themselves, but that doesn't mean that they're strategically worthwhile to pursue. 
Um, a non-reformist reform is one that fundamentally challenges the logic and the power of capital. Something like uh, Medicare for All, which um, brings a large section of the economy into public ownership and opens the door for um, stuff like the nationalization of hospitals. Uh, just that that's something that um, would that that does pose a fundamental challenge to um, to capitalism. Something like tax credits that may be fine and good, but it, it, that's not going to get us anywhere ultimately. Um, and yeah, another uh, task for us and another um, another tenet of democratic socialism is that we need to rebuild the links between the labor movement and the socialist movement. In this way, there's a through line really from, from Marx and Engels all the way to, to us in that we recognize that if we want to bring about uh, political change, we're going to have to do it um, it's going to have to be through the self-emancipation of the working class, the working class getting organized um, and conquering political power. Um, so that's that's what democratic socialism is. Another thing is commitment to class struggle. Um, this is really one of the major shortcomings of post-war social democracy is uh, the, the um, opposite commitment, basically, the commitment to class compromise and to making peace with the capitalist rather than going to war with them. Um, and the other thing is the democratic road to socialism. This is, uh, this is um, basically the idea that we're fighting on two different terrains. One is in the workplace, the fight um, of uh, workers and unions, against capitalists and one in the political are arena, uh, electing socialists. And um, these two things work in tandem toward an eventual rupture, a uh, break with capitalism. And um, that's, that's basically the whole uh, presentation.